Ryan. What's up, Club WWI? Com members, this is James Gutman, and I'm standing by with this week's guest on Radio Free Insanity, and of course you get to hear the interview first. Uh, he's a guy, and, and I say this a lot, that needs no introduction, but this time really honestly, uh, really needs no introduction. He's the one and only Kevin Nash. Kevin, how are you, man? What's up, man? How you doing? Yeah, we well, really appreciate you taking the time out to uh, to join us here on the show. How is uh, How are things going for you? Good. Uh, just trying to get over the shoulder operation I had. Slowly but surely, it's getting better. Yeah, well, I mean, we've, we've still been watching you in TNA, kind of uh, enjoying the uh, the skits you've been doing with the uh, the X Division. And I, I think one of the main things that, that I'm curious about, I think a lot of people are curious about, uh, what is it about the X Division that you saw that, that you wanted to kind of work with them and uh, and be a part of some storylines with them? Well, I think the biggest thing is that, uh, you know, they're, they're really incredible athletes. And uh, I got a chance to... Uh, when I first did the angle when I was coming in uh, with the X Division guys, uh, I got a chance to spend time with them. And uh, it's it's amazing because they, they have the uh, the same love and drive that, that, you know, that I used to have 20 years ago when I got in the business. Uh-huh. And it's just nice to see it, and it's, it's, it's contagious. It's nice to be around. You know, they have fun. They come to work and they have fun. That's what it's supposed to be like. If you're a wrestler because you love to do it, it's fun. And, you know, Sanjay and, and Saban and Alex and Austin and Jay. I mean, those those, those are guys been doing the most stuff with. I mean, it's just it's been it's been great working with them. Mm-hmm. Well, it's also cool too because I think one of the things with the X Division guys, and we saw this with the cruiserweights in WCW, it's that they go out there and they they do their moves, but very rarely do they really have good storylines kind of associated with them. And, and this is kind of a way to to give them uh, new characters and, and new direction. Right, and the thing is, is, is because the, everything's so loosely uh, scripted that we're doing, it gives them a chance to kind of be themselves, mm-hmm. or at least be how they want to be you know, portrayed. I mean, they can kind of have a chance to like, experiment with, with their own characters, which is kind of nice. Yeah, I mean, one of the big criticisms we hear from a lot of people talking about the business today is that so many things are so scripted that a lot of guys, uh, you know, they can read the lines when they're there, but then once they leave the company, they're... They really don't have any uh, improv skills. They don't know how to really kind of go out there and just speak from the heart. And it's kind of a way of, of getting them to uh, to learn an art that a lot of people aren't doing anymore. Yeah, I think that's. I mean, when I went back to New York to WWE, uh, you know, gosh, I I need bullet points. I, I don't need to be scripted because you know I might think of something that's really funny while I'm out there. But it was it was really scripted to the point where it was it was stifling and controlling and. You know, it just—it it, it was very hard for for me, who has ha, had no problem with that. But in, in their defense, you know, they, there's a lot of people that can't do anything, yeah, and have to be scripted. But I think you really got to go on an individual basis. I don't think that it can be kind of a across the board situation. I think that you know you have to handle it, uh, talent individually, and I think that's one thing that uh, is not being done in the business right now. Yeah, well, I mean, that's, that's another question. I mean, uh, out there right now is that a lot of these guys are coming in. They're they're getting trained in kind of different ways than I don't want to say they used to get trained, but but it, than they used to get trained. I, th- I think a lot of guys today, um, uh, and I've heard this from a lot of teachers in the business, aren't really learning the fundamentals uh, before going out there. They just get an idea of what the what the sizzle is, but they, they don't really learn any of the steak before they get into the ring. I mean, it's 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 the, the psychology is the hard thing to learn. I mean, it's anybody can do the moves, but if you do the moves and don't sell anything, then it's just you know, it's it, the psychology is the hardest thing to learn, and, and that only happens from, from really repetition. And it's really hard now for guys. And when I broke in, it was it wasn't that hard to get 300 matches a year. Yeah. You know, and nowadays, you know, the, the guys are lucky if they get you know a tenth of that. So. Well, I, I want to ask you about when you, when you broke into the, uh, the business because I think uh, you, you're kind of known for, for you know the NWO and the things that you did later on in your career. But early on, uh, you had two gimmicks that really, to know you now, it, it, it's so uh, bizarre for you. But both the Master Blaster, but I, I think the big one was uh, was Oz when you came in with it with the silver hair and, and doing kind of the, the Wizard of Oz gimmick. And I was always curious about how this came about and, and who approached you with that and what your response was. That was that was Dusty's idea. I was in a contract at the time, so I mean, you know, he was the booker and he said, do you want to do this? And I was sitting on my couch getting a paycheck, but yeah. you know, I knew that that was going to run out. The only way that I was going to get it renewed was to, you know, to go ahead and do the gimmick. So I went ahead and got my contract renewed and, uh, you know, that thing died a quick death. I ended up going doing it mostly in Japan. Mm-hmm. And, uh, but still it was just, you know, it was, I was, I was a greenhorn and I, I didn't really know the business that well and, you know, Dusty was a legend and a lot of times in the business you think that just because somebody's had success they know and a lot of times they don't know. 
just might be completely, you know. I, that's one thing I, I've always is, is amazed me is that these, some people just can't. Um, I think they want to rehash things like, well, you know, this worst worked in 1961. Like I would never try to rehash the NWO because it's just it, it's a different era. You know, we did that during the East Coast West Coast wars with the rap wars. I mean, it was kind of a different whole climate pop pop culturally, and then now it's just you kind of pretty much if you don't stay current with pop culture, I don't see how you can come up with ideas that are going to you know influence the, the, the you know 14 to, to 25 demographic. I just unless you know what's going on pop culturally, it just you can't do it. And I don't think a lot of the people that are in the creative process at, at the companies um, are doing that. Yeah, that seems like almost like that wrestling bubble. Like you're you're in the, the business so long that, that you tend to forget that there's a whole world out there that you should be drawing your your inspiration and stories from. Well, it's just like to me, like you know, this, this whole wrestling craze that you know they want to um, give the guys a shot of uh, females. Uh, you know, it's like, if I want to watch a girl do something, the last thing I'm going to watch is a wrestling show. <laughs> Absolutely, man. You know, I mean, there's a, there's a lot of, <laughs> of web pages and everything else out there on earth, man. It's just like, the last thing I'll do is watch two girls wrestle in lingerie. Yeah. Well, it's just not something I, I mean, I, I, I want my wrestling, I want my wrestling. If I want my girls, I want my girls. I don't want them all smashed together like that. Yeah, especially on a channel like, like USA where, where you know that, you know, no one's getting yeah. naked anyway. Right, so if it's going to happen, so. Yeah. You know. Well, let me ask you, because one of the things that you brought up, which is interesting, you talked about uh, the NWO. And a lot of people brought, you know, when they think of the NWO, they, they think of D-Generation X. And right now they're redoing kind of that angle, uh, Hunter and Sean over in WWE. And some people saying maybe it's not hitting all cylinders and things like that. And I was curious, if you were there and you were a part of it, what would what would you suggest uh, they do to, to fix it, if it's even fixable at all? Like, what do you think is wrong uh, right now with, with that storyline and that gimmick? The only way the, the only way it works when you're the anti-establish guys, you almost have to be heels. Uh-huh. They were heels, and then they could be then they could be like. Um, like me and Scott would do the NWO right now. We could make it work because we'd, we'd be acting like we were 30, but we're like older 40 guys. So now we're the, now we're the drunk dad at the birthday party. Uh-huh. You know, it's yeah. like, oh, dad, stop. So then it works because you get heat off of that because you think you're still young, hip, and cool, but you're not. You can make some really obscure references. And, but it's, it's hard when you're baby faces because on top of that, I mean, the, the, the big, the biggest reason that DX isn't working like it should, and not at all sellers, they really don't have anybody to work against. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, there was, you know, there were two really good heels in there that were established. Even, even, you, know, you take the nasty boys in their prime, they'd have a better run with them than anybody else. Uh-huh. You know, just anybody that was an established, you know, heel tag team, but they just, they keep, you know, mix matching and throwing guys at them, and, you know, like, you know, on the road, Flair's part of DX. It's just like, what? Yeah. <laughs> well, absolutely, man. It's like an What do you mean? What, what did he, not Flair get DX. <laughs> he was like the guy that they were created uh, kind of to stand against that tradition, and now he's uh, he's in there with them. Right. Like, he's, he's in DX? Why? Because you guys want to do six man and take less bumps on the road. Okay. I mean, it's just, it's, it's really kind of a deal where it's just, but I mean, I don't blame Hunter or Sean or, or even Rick. I mean, hell, I mean, I don't want to bump any more than I have to either. Uh-huh. You know, so it's just, it, it's hard, man. It's, it's, it's really hard for Paul. You know, I, I watch the show and everybody gives Hunter and, and, and Sean grief, but I still think, man, that they're so far above everybody else in and that, and that raw roster. Oh, well, it's a scary roster. When you kind of look at it, I, I remember I was talking about, well, Cena should be feuding with somebody else, and I actually went to WWE.com and went down the list. Cool. I couldn't find any heels. I couldn't find one. Exactly. <laughs> That's what I do. I go, hey, if I was quicker than I would, oh, jeez, I'd shut my mouth. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I do. Yeah, Trevor Murdoch. Yeah. yeah. Exactly. It's just like, everybody gives, everybody gives creative a hard time, and it's just like, you know what, guess what? You can't pull a rabbit if you have to. Do you think the problem is they're pulling up guys too too soon? Because that's been a big criticism. Guys coming up uh, from like OVW and, and some of the uh, the independent companies getting getting shots uh, before they're really ready to be on TV. Do you think that's a problem at all? I think the pro- I think that it's not. I mean, the problem is there's just there's just not any talent. Uh-huh. You know, I mean, it's just. And what's happening is is 
because they're trying to find new faces, and it's just, I, I think they, you know, as bad as it is, they, they have to do it kind of by, by live fire. Yeah. You know, just like, is this going to work? Is this not going to work? And it's just like, well, geez, okay, that didn't work. But, you know, they, they've got to do something to, to get new faces on TV. They're trying, you know, it's one of those things where they look at it, I'm sure they just look at it and go, you know, geez, if Ben Wallace be that, how much more are we going to get out of them? Uh-huh. And then, uh, you know, how long is Chris going to continue to do this? And, and, they, and they, they look at it and they go, okay, well, let's, you know, let's see if we can like, find somebody to start, you know, working in that Ben Wallace spot on the card. And then it's just like, this, you know, it's like, go ahead and, I mean, Try to replace them. You can't do it. You know, you can't, rep- you know, the, the guys are so, you know, Chris has been around 20 years, and it's just like you just, you just don't find some kid that's been in the business two years that comes anywhere near, and then you look at it and you go, well, yeah, you go down the roster with that, and it's, it's that's the reason Axel Duncan's still on the card. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. You know, I mean, it's just like he's got more charisma than 99% of the guys. Yeah. So it's just, it, it, it becomes such a hard situation for a creative person. It's just like, and it takes so long to build a piece of talent that, that has any kind of Q rating whatsoever. People are flipping channels. Yeah. You got to watch SmackDown. I'll turn SmackDown on. I'll turn it off because after two matches and not knowing who anybody is, it's just like, well, I don't want to watch this. Well, the character, yeah, the character development, especially, I think, on, on SmackDown, it's too much too soon, like when they bring in, you know, five new women all in the same week, and they can't figure out right. why no one relates to them. I mean, I, I was, I mean, I, I don't watch a whole lot of wrestling anymore, but it's like they had this, like, that Mr. Kennedy or whatever, and he was wrestling Undertaker, and I'm like, okay, you know, I just, I just came out of the, uh, out of a coma, <laughs> and... I don't know who this Kennedy guy is. He's half Undertaker's size, and he's fighting Undertaker. And I'm supposed to think that this guy's going to beat him? Yeah. But I mean, I'm looking back. I'm like, who? Yeah, I mean, a lot has changed, especially with uh, as, as far as, as people that some of the bigger guys have to work with. I remember uh, that big show go out there with Kane, and I wanted to get your thoughts on this because you're a uh, you know you're, you're a large wrestler, so you always work kind of a big man style. They had Kane go out there with Big Show, and they did the chain wrestling on Raw. Uh, earlier this year, and we're still getting emails from people about it asking why that happened. I mean, it, it's gotten to the point where even the guys who were supposed to be wrestling a certain style aren't even wrestling that style anymore because they're kind of trying to fit into a mold now. Well, what happens is everybody becomes Mark. Uh-huh. You know, they start reading the sheets, and it's just like, you know, with these, you know, they, they tell me I can't work, so I better start, you know, grabbing their arm bar, and I better start doing this. It's just like, once you create a stimulant, to me, if you start changing your style or start or start changing your signature stuff, it's just like obviously that you 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 or you don't feel that you're who you are. I mean, it's just like if somebody tells me, "Oh, he's horrible. He's this. He's that. He's this. He's that." I'm like, I'm the same guy I've always been. I'm not going to change my mode uh, or, or or my or my pace or my character. It's like this is how I work, you know. Yeah. I do five things. <laughs> you know? Okay. I, I do five or six things. That's all I do. I'm not going to trail in something just because some guy in a sheet says I'm boring. Yeah. Because my whole thing is, is I've been in a lot of fights in my life. You know, you punch him, you kick him, you gouge your eyes, you kick him in the balls. I mean, there's not that many things you do in a real fight. Uh-huh. I watch that uh, mixed martial arts. What do they do? They punch, they grapple, they punch, they elbow, they grab. I mean, yeah. a couple of them have a couple of chokeholds and a couple of uh, arm bars and stuff. And, but, I mean, it's just, I don't see anybody going off the top of the cage with stuff. Yeah. We had a, we interviewed Bad News Brown, and he had said that, you know, when he's in a street fight, he said, if anyone does a triple flip, they're going to triple flip off the pavement. You know, that's pretty much it. Yeah, it's, it's about believability, and I think, um, well, I want to ask you about kind of the uh, the hardcore fans who, who, you know, I mean, there's a lot of people who have a lot of uh, ideas about you before even getting to know you or, or speaking to you or anything like that. And one of the things that people bring up a lot is uh, is the click, which has always been the big thing. And there's been lots of wrestlers who've kind of traveled together and, and talked together. Uh, there's very few that people, you know, looked at, pointed to, and named you know, um, and when we had Orlando Jordan on, he talked a lot about like haters in the business and people who like to do that. What do you, what do you attribute the uh, the amount of attention that you guys got? 
uh, early on in your career when, when you were in WWF? I think that what happened was that um, kind of that higher echelon, the Hulk, Randy, you know, DiBiase, the really the WWF, the, you know, as it was known, had disintegrated, mm-hmm. and you know they they marked it as the new generation, but it was basically you know a bunch of new guys, and we we traveled together, and I guess we were a new breed of guys because. Wrestling business has always been so backstabbing and, and so uh, non-trusting, and it was just kind of a it was like you know kind of like traveling with pirates. <laughs> yeah. And uh, we just kind of made a pact that we wouldn't stab each other in the back. We'd tell each other what we got on payoffs, and we'd be honest to each other. And we always figured that when he looked at the locker when it came down to it, it was you know we always said we were a team or this or that, but. In essence, it was, you know, 35 individuals. Mm-hmm. And we always felt that if we could, you know, I, I was a Detroit kid. I mean, I, I realized, you know, we could unionize to some degree. And the people always said, you know, union would never work. But we kind of had a five-man union. And we were able to get a lot of control because there were five of us. And there's a lot of times that, there, you know, we were the main event, semi-main event, and another, another match that five of us were involved in, three of the eight matches on the card, and usually in pretty good position. So we we had a voice, and, I mean, we, we just politically used that voice. We never did anything for the detriment of the, of the business or the detriment of the company because we got paid on what we drew. Mm-hmm. Well, I mean, you're actually, I mean, you bring up something very interesting when you talk about unions because that's something that I've always kind of felt like, too. I, I don't understand why still at this point people can't really get together, but from what you're saying, uh, from looking at it, it sounds like, that is kind of what you guys had on, on a smaller scale. What do you think it is about the business that made people, instead of uh, trying to, I don't want to say imitate, but kind of imitate that, that camaraderie with somebody else, uh, and instead they just used it to, uh, to kind of point fingers? I and mean, what, what is it about the business that makes people uh, just so adverse to, uh, to gaining any control? Well, the, the, biggest, the biggest problem we had was we, we had some power, and, and it was the jealousy of the people that weren't in the club. Uh-huh. You know, just like wow, she's these guys, and we were we were pretty impregnable, and we were fine with the five members we had, so there was no reason to really expand. Uh-huh. And uh, but I mean, Yoko and Taker were BSK; they had like a little click also, and they had you know Yoko and, and Taker, and they had a click alone. Was I mean that was kind of those were kind of the two power brokers in, in that early uh, WWF era. Uh-huh. So. I don't understand why if, if, the, if the WWE is so heavily scripted now that, that, that they, they can't qualify to be a like APRA. Yeah, I feel like that. I, don't yeah. you know, I mean, it's, it's a scripted television show. It's on. I don't understand why the guys don't get together and uh, pay the dues or get a representative and, and, and just see if they can qualify for, for you know, the for, uh, you know, and, and that way they'd get insurance. It's just, I don't understand. I mean, I'm a member of Screen Actors Guild, so I mean, I take care of myself, but I just don't understand why the guys don't in order to do that. Because it wasn't scripted, but now I hear their show's very scripted. Yeah. Oh, right, yeah, right down, line for line and all that. Right, if it's a scripted show, then I don't see why you couldn't go after that. Well, it even seems like when, when he went out there in, in the mid-'80s and admitted that it was entertainment and it was, you know, choreographed, it seems like it's, it's been almost 20 years in the making that, you know, this is a, a, an entertainment product on, on cable television, you know, and there's shows that have far less TV time and, and I guess, work hours than these guys have, and, and meanwhile, they're not getting any of the benefits from it. Because I can guarantee you that, our, that, that the wrestling shows are probably a lot more uh, scripted than Kirby Enthusiasm is. Oh, yeah, well, definitely. Okay. You know, so, I mean, it's just... I don't know, I just, there's always going to be that negative connotation with wrestling, mm-hmm. and as long as guys, you know, continue to die on a yearly basis, I guess it's not going to change. Yeah. Well, very little gets even mainstream attention anymore. I mean, I want to ask you, because, uh, I mean, you seem to be somebody within the industry who, who recognizes these things and understands a lot of these things, and I mean, at any point do you think in your career that you would ever want to, maybe after, you know, you're done wrestling, uh, you know, have some sort of backstage position within a company or, or perhaps even, uh, and I want to throw this out there, but even even try to get people together to do a union or something to that effect? Uh, you know, I mean, I, I've actually, 
she thought about contacting the uh, Screen Actors Guild mapper and, see, and, and seeing if, if we could get something going for the guys just to, to take care of guys. I mean, I see guys walk around backstage you know, with injuries you can't get them fixed because they don't have insurance. And the thing is, is once you become a pro wrestler, you know, good luck going to Blue Cross and saying, hey, I'm a pro wrestler with my premium. Yeah, exactly. You know, it's just like, so... You know, and all the sheets talk about, oh, we need the drug test, they need to have this cardio health. Man, the guys need insurance. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. You they know, why that. can't, you know, all independent contractors, how are we independent? Mm -hmm. We can't go, well, I can't go wrestle on WWF tomorrow and then be on TNA the next day. I, I go, I, independent, independent contractor means I can paint your house, go across the street and paint the other house. Yeah. You know, we're not independent. It's just, it's, by filing a 1098 tax form, that means that way there they don't have to pay insurance. I mean, they don't have to pay. Uh, they don't have to pay the taxes. Yeah. You know, we have to pay the individualized taxes every year. Yeah, it's just, it's just, there's not, there's not anybody. I mean, you look at the NBA guys get like 60 percent of the revenue. We, I think, wrestlers get about three. Yeah. Oh yeah. You know, from what from what the companies make, it's just. It, but it's one of those things that you know, it's, that's the way it's always been. And now that you know, I'm at the twilight of my wrestling career as far as uh, being active. Just like, well, I, I, I'll do what I can to help TNA, but you know, the other guys are kind of. I mean, it's, it's time for somebody else to fight the fight. Well, that's what, that's what I was going to say, because one, one of the things that I've always wondered is that it seems like a lot of the old school mentality of, you know, this is the way the business is, it's always going to be like that. Um, and, and I feel like we're still waiting for that new generation to kind of come along and say, well, wait a minute, this isn't the way it should be, though. Do you think that there's too many guys who already have that mindset in the ears of some of the younger guys? I mean, do you think that we're a generation or two away from maybe a union, or do you think it's something that there's just, the, you know, the, the bad apple's already there and it's just going to keep spreading? Well, I mean, I thought this new generation guys would, 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 would kind of maybe bond together because they were, you know, they were internet savvy. And I think that at the same time, it's just like they're more individualized than we are because they don't go to bars together, don't hang out together. They kind of just do their own little thing. Uh -huh. You know, a group of guys, you know, it's, it's just guys play video games, watch DVDs, and spend time on a computer. It's like when I was, you know, it, in, in wrestling, and we'd be in a good city like Chicago or New York, so like that. And there'd be 20 guys with their, you know, with their, with their getting, putting on decent clothes because we were all going to go out that night. Yeah. You know, and so it's just, we were more like a, even like a, more like a football team, and, and now it's even more individualized, and yeah. I think there's such a, such a, a huge, uh, difference between the top of the card and the bottom of the card back then. Because we did wrestle so much, we, you know, we were, even though the, if you were the, the, the guy that came out first match, you were still part of the team because you were on the road 25, you know, days a month, these guys. Yeah. Well, I mean, you were, I mean, one of, one of the things that I definitely wanted to ask you about um, was when you were in WCW. Because, uh, I mean, you're referencing, you know, top of the card, bottom of the card, and the travel that you did. Um, when you guys were there, uh, I remember WCW for a while was really the number one promotion uh, in WWF when they were presenting a lot of their kind of lackluster stuff. You guys were beating them for a while. And they always said the history books are kind of written by the winners. And now it seems like almost when people think of WCW, they think of, uh, you know, just a promotion that went out of business. But what, what's your personal take on, on the way people have viewed WCW, the way, the way history is kind of portrayed? And, and do you think it's had a, a bad rap, uh, or do you think a lot of the criticisms kind of been justified? Uh, I mean, it's... Yeah, to me, it's like Guns N' Roses. It's Guns N' Roses is a good band. Well, they only had a couple year run, but I mean, they're still one of the best bands of all time. I mean, WCW during the Eric Bischoff days was a success. I mean, put it this way. Put Vince McMahon on one side and put all the guys that beat his ass on the other side. All right. You know? Yeah. There's only one. Only one, only one guy that ever beat Eric, uh, that ever beat Vince McMahon's ass, and that was Eric. Yeah. I don't care how he did it. You know, he bought this, he bought that, he did this, he did that. For almost two, I think it was two years we beat him. It was a lot. Ratings. Yeah. Was, you know, not, not a week, not a month, two years. Yeah, well, I mean, I was, I was in college during, uh, when you guys were doing the NWO, and I remember that every Monday for a long time, I mean, well over a year, we would watch 
nitro, and very rarely would we put on. I think Jim Ross was doing the, he had the fake diesel and the fake Razor Ramona, I think, at the time, and we just flipped it right back over. It was just the, the quality of the product was so different back then, and I think a lot of fans who have kind of showed up after the buyout never really realized the, the quality that you guys are putting out there and how different it was than a lot of the shows that they've been watching. I think with ours was, ours was live, but it was really live. Mm-hmm. I mean, if, if, any, if any show was raw, it was us. Mm-hmm. There was a lot of times, man, it was 8 o'clock and the show wasn't done. We had guys going out for the first match and the shows weren't done. Yeah. You know, it was, it was, we always just call it a fight. It was like a torpedo drill on a submarine every Monday. And it was a party too, man. There was beer in. I mean, there was a lot of good times. Yeah. I mean, it was an absolute party. The party carried on after it. Well, there was, I yeah. loved going to work on Mondays. Well, at what point did you did you kind of get a feeling that that things were uh, were going down? I mean, was there ever one moment where you said, "Wait a minute, I think." Yeah, when AOL well bought the company. Oh yeah. I said, I mean, I've, I've said this a million times. Nobody ever gets it that it's just like, you know. I mean, there's actually books out that, that accredit me to killing WCW, like I'm one of the major guys, and it's just like, you know guys, I had nothing really to do with the tech stop dropping in 99. Yeah. I really did I mean, as much, I mean, I know that I, you guys conceive me as having power, but I really don't have enough power to make the entire uh, tech stop drop, you know? Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it, it became a situation where Time Warner stock was worth at one point almost $70, and, uh, AOL came in, and the next thing you know, they're down 17, 18 bucks yeah. for sure. I mean, it's just, it, it, so think that's right. WCW, I killed that. Who killed the Hawks and the Braves and everybody else they sold? <laughs> yeah. I mean, it, it was, was that Schmoltz? I mean, I don't, I didn't get any of the, the memos. It's just like, the wrestling people are so naive of how things work in big business. Mm-hmm. It's like, man, the company, AOL, AOL folded, tech folded, and guess what? We were casualty of war. Mm-hmm. Simple as that. What? We were still, I mean, it, what, at the end of our show, we were still doing threes. Yeah, so I mean higher than they're kind of doing now. We're on, on Raw anyway. Right, we're still doing threes. Find something on, on, on TNT, TNT besides what, maybe Law and Order, that they're probably paying a million and a half bucks to put play an episode and the closer which they probably shoot for a million and six I mean we were, we were probably four or five hundred thousand dollars an episode for three hours of original programming every Monday I mean that's my whole thing I used to sit down with the executives from TBS and TNT and go let me get this right so you guys just did this holocaust movie you guys spent 28 million dollars on it you're happy to a, a point seven <laughs> No, no, no. Like, are, are, so why? So when you go to the Cable Ice Awards, you can feel good about yourself? Are we in the in, in the in the business of doing numbers? And, 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 and I mean, well, yeah, but your numbers don't equate to, to uh, advertising. So you can tell me that you can't get for a five, but you can get for a point seven. Mm-hmm. No, Maybe you need to get some new advertising people. Yeah, I mean, it, it sounds like yeah, so many people are were more concerned about you know being associated, I guess, with wrestling rather than trying to make money off of it. It's always been that way. When I didn't mean, think got hot, we ran rampant through the Cable Ace Awards. And we'd, I mean, you could just see the people like, oh, my God, I can't believe this, this is hot, and we're going to have to just deal with it. <laughs> oh, yeah. And, uh, it was just, it was, it, was, it was a wonderful time because we were so mainstream. Mm-hmm. Well, yeah, that was, you know, guys that were took, uh, I mean, we were at the point where NWO shirts were, uh, were, I mean, were all over the place. I don't think people really realized the extent of it. Well, I want to think, I mean, because with the Internet fans, and this is a question for you, you do, you have gotten a lot of criticism from different people uh, for just uh, perceiving things. And it kind of seems like the timing of, of losing the TV and the AOL buyout and all that kind of happened when the company was hitting uh, kind of a creative low point in some situations. And do you think that a lot of fans, they, they only watch the product on TV and they say, well, you know, they went out of business because the show was so bad, but meanwhile... There were lots of other times where promotions were putting out far worse in creative products and, and still surviving for a while. Do you think fans just tend to focus too much on, on what they see on the screen and just don't realize how much goes into it? I mean, it, I look at it and I say this. The show was bad. Yeah, the sh- it was in a creative thing. How was it? I mean, everything, everything, everything goes, everything goes, uh, inside, everything's cyclic. Uh-huh. You know, and we also had, you know, people don't understand anything that went, this is what I love too, and, I, and I'll get back to that, that question, but uh-huh. the 
I'm just like, well, this would be my idea. Yeah, guess what? The two guys that, that, that you're involving in your idea don't want to do it. Yeah. So now what? Oh, well, geez, then I would, exactly. Then you would compromise and not get what you wanted. Mm -hmm. And I thought that you could, I could write the most incredible piece of uh, dialogue for somebody, but they can butcher it on, on, on the uh, execution. Mm -hmm. Guess what? Bad TV. Was it written wrong? No. Was it executed wrong? Yes. Yeah. So you also, you know, I mean, you can have the greatest show in the, in the world, and the execution's piss poor. It's a horrible show. Mm -hmm. I think it's great, and execution's not. It's only, especially when you're shooting live with no net, if you got raw guys out there, you're only going to get what you get. Mm -hmm. There's no take backs. No, I know. Well, actually, I remember I, I'd actually read where you had talked about, uh, like, Lenny and Lodi, how the, how the finale for that was supposed to be... Uh, but they were brothers, and they never even yeah. let you guys go through with that. Of course they wouldn't, wouldn't let us go through with that. Yeah. I mean, you know, Vince McMahon never had standard of practices from USA in the booking uh, room. Uh-huh. Yeah. We're standard of practice guy. Right in the middle of our room at our booking yeah. meetings. Amazing. Yeah. Yeah. So, so it's one of those things that, you know, handcuffed me, blindfold me, and tell me, gee, you know, if you lost the race. I, so, I, mean, I, I look at it and I said, I got paid the book, I got paid huge to sit and not wrestle. Mm -hmm. So at the end of the day, I went, I really don't care what anybody says. Yeah. I caused it to end, okay, you have to cause it to end. You know, every night I, 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 I toss and turn because I killed <laughs> Well, no, I mean, I, I, haven't, I, have, I haven't slept since. Oh, I'm not saying that. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> about that because I think one of the things that, that a lot of fans they tend to uh, make the characters that you play on TV or the things that you say when you're, when you're on television doing a wrestling promotion they kind of take them to heart and sometimes think that they're real and when you guys debuted in, in TNA you, you played up the, the kind of the, the gimmick of being you know we're going to destroy TNA you know all the guys going to be miserable here do you think a lot of fans take what you say in, in your interviews and think well that's him you know and, and that, that must be what he's like in real life I mean do you think they take it too seriously God, I hope so. Okay. <laughs> I mean, that's that's kind of what we do. I mean, that's yeah. you know, to, to to be able to you know, people, what what people don't understand is like what what people say that God, I hate this guy, this guy upsets me, or I think he's this, or I think he's that. It all it does is empower the people that go out and try to convey a message and completely make people irate. When the people, you know, we put out a lure and you bite it and run two hundred yards with it. And then you turn around and say, God, I hate that guy. And you're like, dude, I wanted you to hate me. Did not understand you just made my day? Yeah. Yeah, totally. It's just like, I'm, I'm, pull, I'm pulling your strings and, and asking for a response, and 99% of the time, I get it. Yeah. I could go after one person tomorrow on the Internet, any of the dirt guys. I could just go after them on my web. And that, that person would be irate and fire, and it would become a war. And it's just, I would be pushing buttons. Uh -huh. Oh, yeah, well, the internet's kind of become big for that, yeah, where people are able to, I mean, if they really mention one person by name and it becomes a, a, a major Yeah, problem. and, 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 and it, would, it would become a war because that person, his credibility is now in life. Like, no, it's not, dude. Number one, you, you, you write about something that's fake. <laughs> yeah. You know, it's not like, you know, nobody's batting 300 and didn't curve balls. It's just like, you know, the biggest thing that, 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 that kills me is, is there's just not more false information. Like, you know, it's... It, it, Basically, the dirt sheets are the intelligence business. Uh -huh. I mean, it's just a, a simple form of intelligence like that like goes throughout the world. And there's just not enough false information. Okay. You know, guys, I mean, you could, if you got like, you know, got everybody in the room all right, this is the new deal. Everybody's going to throw out false information. And you just call the guys and get false information, false information, false information. You can sit back and laugh your ass off. Uh-huh. Oh, yeah. Because that, they get all their information basically from inside. I mean, that, that's, that's why it's an insider thing. All, it's all these guys that are talking to the sheets that give them the information. Yeah. You know, so if guys don't, if nobody, if, if nobody talks to anybody, if they do, they give false information. But it only will ever do it because, you know, Joe Schmo's too worried about making sure he gets a four and a half star match the night. <laughs> Well, did you ever figure out any of the people, like when you were at, uh, I'm going to keep saying WCW, but anywhere you were ever at, I mean, did you ever uh, realize somebody that, that you thought was kind of...
kind of leaking things, maybe had a, uh, a grudge. Yeah, I, 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 but naturally, they, I always looked at it this way, that, that was your prerogative, and, you know, when I'd look at the end of it, 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 it would be a, uh, a right down my match, it'd be like, you know, da 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 dud.
DNA too, and I wanted to know your thoughts on it, if you still kind of feel that way. Uh, you always said, in this business you can make friends or you can make money. Uh, I just want to get your ideas, uh, you know, behind that and how you feel it as far as the line with True. the True. I've always thought, I've always, you know, we, you know Scott and I always give credit to Ch uh, Chief Chase Trombo with that. Mm -hmm. Chief told us a long time ago, I know, man, he would get mad and be like, Dude, make friends, you can make money, you can't make both. That's the truth. It's real hard because you, it's, it's a really selfish business. You can go, you can be in a match with your buddy that's kind of underneath the guy. You can go out there and give a little bit extra, but really, does it, I mean, if they're doing certain things to character and you're not giving the, you know, if you're not giving the guy that you're working with on a night and night out basis that same amount, you can't do it. You got to be selfish. Mm -hmm. You know? Yeah. It's like a movie. You know? You, 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 if, if a guy's the fast talk in the movie and he completely just hook links the other guy, you can't, just because your buddy's the other actor, you can't let him go, oh, blow me. Uh -huh. You can't do that. He doesn't get that line in. Mm -hmm. You know, it just doesn't happen. So it's just, uh, but. Uh, kind of like separating the business and the, uh, and the personal. It really is. I mean, and, and that's the, the biggest thing that kills me is, you know, they always call it the business, especially the office. The office calls it the business, the business. But, man, as soon as you treat it like a business, boy. Yeah. You know, it's just why, I mean, it's a business for us, not for you. <laughs> what do you mean? It's a business for everybody. That's right. It is a business. I mean, that's what it is. I leave my house and leave my family and I'm gone for several days. Number one, I want to be paid. I want to be paid well. I want to be taken care of. I want to be treated well. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm leaving my home. I'm leaving my family. It's just, it's not too much to ask. Yeah. When you go on a movie set, they treat you like you're the, you know, King of France. I mean, especially a lot of the guys, too, once, uh, you know, I've seen a lot of guys that once their careers are over, it's not really, you know, they don't exactly have a, a ton of cash left over, and you, and you want to look over your career and be like, you know, this is what I accomplished, and, and you can one day just finish off and, and be with your family when it's all done. And 90% of it, I mean, a lot of guys might not have a lot of money left, but I guarantee you there's not a guy that gets out of the business that hasn't had a, at least some of the most memorable times in his life, even if he's in it for a year, mm -hmm. because the guys really go out of their way to have a good time. Yeah. And it's, it is fun. I mean, it, it's the reason that we, you know, people always ask me, you know, what do you miss the most about, you know, not being in, in the wrestling. It's like the guys, man, like the, sitting in the locker room before the matches and, and cracking up and making fun of each other. And, you know, that's, that's what, you know, that's what's gold in this business is that. And, you know, and, and you do get, and, and through it all, you know, you do get some friends. I mean, Hunter and Sean and, and uh, Sean Waltman and Scott Hall, I mean, those guys are my friends. I mean, they really are my friends. And, and guys like Jeff Jarrett have been my friends for years and years and years. And it's really, I mean, it's, it's a pleasure to see them every couple of weeks. That's really cool. You know, it's, you know I've got, I've got, I'm blessed that I've got some really good friends in this business. That's good. Well, the last question I want to ask you, and it's something that I ask uh, every guest that we have on here, uh, if you could pick anybody, either somebody that came uh, before, I mean, you're actually still active, so I wouldn't say after you, but somebody who came before your time in the ring, or maybe somebody you never ran into, that you always said, if I could have worked with this person, we probably would have made some money and had some good matches. Uh, who would you pick? Jeez. That's what everybody says, man. I always get everybody with that one. Well, I mean, if you've had a career like most of us had, I mean, you know, I've been around for so long as I've wrestled from this era. I've wrestled uh, Rock and Steve. Okay. Um, I've wrestled Sting. I've wrestled Luger. I've wrestled Hogan. I've wrestled Piper. I've wrestled Flair. I've wrestled Funk. Maybe somebody that you, that you grew up watching maybe before before you got in. The only guy, I mean, Andre would be the only guy I could think of. Huh. You know, Andre the Giant would be the only guy that, uh, if I had to pick, like, I mean, of course I would have loved to have wrestled Jesse. Jesse Ventura? Yeah. I think, you know, I'd love to have been a baby face to have him. Yeah, that would have been cool. I don't think I ever had a one-on-one -on -one with Tom Zink. Oh, well, there you go. I miss Tom Zink. Right. I throw him into every interview now. That's what does he want? I do think. I mean, I mean he's like, he's fell off the edge of the earth. I haven't heard much from him in a, in a while. Oh, I'm, I'm, I keep throwing him out on my interviews and on my stuff on TNA just to see if I can get him to, you know. To respond? I always, I always thought Tom was a good guy. So I'm just, hopefully he'll resurface. Uh, Tom, if you're listening, drop us uh, an email. We'll forward it over. Right. Where, where are you, Z-Man? What's that? Yeah, I don't know. Where are, yeah, where are you, Z-Man? Scott Hall wants to know, too.
to. We had the conversation two nights ago. What happened to email? All right. Last thing, Kev, um, before we let you go, anything you have to say uh, to your fans out there who have been watching you for years? Yeah, I can out there buy those dolls. It's the holiday season. I need the residuals. All right, nice. So return your gifts and give <laughs> and get your chicken and ash dolls, folks. Pick it up. Kev, man. All right, man. I got the legend doll, too. I got the WBF legend doll. Do you really? Oh, yeah. Oh, well. It looks like Diesel, but it says Kevin Nash on it. Oh, yeah. Yeah, so pick up all of Kevin Nash's uh, merchandise. and. Uh, I think there's also a Dudes with Attitude start double set with me and Shawn Michaels during our uh, tag. Uh, I've got three dolls out. Look, get them all, kids. I'll sign them. All right. And if you have the old uh, vibrating WCW ones, you can uh, keep that get one. Get the bomb. <laughs> Kevin, man, thank you so much, bro.